Well, hello there, listener, and welcome to this week's episode of the Better Than Fine podcast. I'm your host, Arlene Marshall, and you might notice that this week I've got a little frog in my throat. Um, Last week, I was in Disney World with my best friend and her wife celebrating their anniversary, and we had a wonderful time, but I came home with an extra souvenir in the form of a positive COVID test. Now, fortunately, through the miracle of modern technology and antiviral medicines, I am doing much better, so I sound a lot worse than I actually am, Uh, which is to say, I'm sorry for the froggy throat, and it's a very interesting day to have our guest today and be talking about recovery and readiness, uh, because the last few days have been an experiment in getting the readiness in order to be here to do the show. So certainly by now, we've all heard that sleep is important to health, to longevity, to well-being. But is that really the whole picture when we're talking about recovery and readiness? You know, I was one of those kids that grew up being on every team and every club, doing every play. I'd leave for school, you know, before 7 a.m., sometimes as early as 5.30, and I'd get home at like 8 or 9 p.m., and I was always busy I was always doing too much. And it was very much normalized for me that I was tired. I was living for the one day every couple of weeks that I would get to sleep in, maybe. And then I became a personal trainer and I learned that the idea that recovery was having some rest days in between my workouts. And I really thought at that time that that was enough. But I often found on a trainer schedule that I would get run down, I'd be grumpy and sore and just kind of tired all the time because of those crazy hours and not really having a life that lended itself toward balance and toward building up capacity over time. And it's been this in this last few years that I've really started to change my relationship with the idea of stimulation and recovery and really to what I've started to think of as making friends with my nervous system. Now, fortunately, today's guest is equipped to educate you and me on deeper states of readiness to achieve a lot more than just a good workout. And I'm really excited that he's here. So the guest today is Stefan Underwood, and he began working with Exos over a decade ago and has grown from his start as a performance coach working with professional athletes switching to Exos' education side, and then growing into leadership. He's now the vice president of methodology, which I think is the coolest job title that I have ever heard, because as you know, I'm a big nerd for science, and I just think that's so cool. He's worked with athletes from IndyCar, the NFL, the UFC, Olympic athletes, and and also with executives, elite military. He knows a thing or three about human performance and what it actually means to be ready for whatever it is that is important in your life. So I'm so grateful to have him here sharing his knowledge with us. Stefan, welcome to Better Than Fine. Hey, Darlene. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, thanks for coming. Um, you, There's a lot that we could explore. And I know in every conversation you and I have had, we have been able to wander far afield. So I'm really excited to share your enthusiasm and your knowledge with our listeners Um, So let's just kick off with this idea of readiness. Like, what does readiness mean to you in all of your vast experience around performance? You know, it's funny because we had this conversation uh, last year. We were working through uh, some work at Exos where we're really positioning ourselves to say Exos gets you ready. That's the thing we do. Like in our simplest form, how can we tell people what we do? We help you get ready for for the moments that matter most uh, in work, in sport, in life anytime, anywhere. And so the question came to me of what does it mean to be ready? And it's one of those that you initially think of like, well, we can look in the dictionary. What does it mean to be ready? But when we really started thinking through it methodologically, it's a balance of two things. One is having the capacity, the abilities to do what you're trying to do. And then the other is to be able to be in the right, what we call functional state, to show up Mm. in the right state, to be able to tap into the abilities that you've built. And I think a lot of people only look at one side of the equation. They're trying to build, I want you to be bigger, faster, stronger, better at self-regulation, more inner awareness, all these things that are abilities, or, hey, let's prioritize your sleep. Let's get you uh, as recovered as possible. And I think that that's a really good starting point to the conversation, but it's not the entire conversation. 
Oh, I have two two branch off questions, but of course, I can't help but think of my own current state of readiness. Um, so to drive it home for the listeners here, I might have the capacity to host this show, but if you had asked me to yesterday, I definitely didn't have the readiness, right? And the ability right. to show up. Okay. So you use the word methodologically. Um, your title is the VP of methodology. Can you just quickly explain what that is since we're throwing that word around? I want the listeners to be on the same page with us. Yeah, absolutely. At the end of the day, we have a responsibility. Uh, and when I say we, I mean, everybody, you know, who coaches in any capacity, we have a responsibility to the people that we serve to our members, to our clients. And the responsibility is to hear what they want, and to help them get there, guide them be the guide by the side, right? Um, mm -hmm. We're not driving the car for them, but we're a guide by the side, but we have a responsibility to bring forward what we know to be evidence-based practice and so when we look at things methodologically it is the structure by which we create our game plans for the people that we serve it is the evidence-based nature to the game plans we provide people to help them get ready for the moments that matter most all right so methodology then is like the how in the container of the what that the coach is creating right the i like this phrase the guide the, yeah <laughs> the how in the container of the what and i like that phrase and, and what I would say is we have responsibility to look at the whole human. And so with that, you know, I get the pleasure of leading a team of experts. And so I've got on the team, we've got, you know, a clinical psychologist, an executive coach. We've got a PhD in applied neuroscience. We have, uh, you know, physiotherapists or physical therapists, excuse me, I'm Canadian. We, we speak a little <laughs> we funny. Physical therapists. We, uh, we've got registered dietitian. We've got strength coaches. We've got a PhD in sports science. So we truly have this interdisciplinary team um, and, and we get to lob whatever the problem of human performance is on the table in front of us, whether it's burnout in the workplace or whether it's running a faster 40 at the NFL combine, we get to lob it on the table and say, okay, let's look at this from the perspective of the whole human. What is evidence-based? What do we want to do? And how do all of these pieces intersect to provide the best path forward uh, for people? Yeah, that sounds a lot like what we're on about here at Better Than Fine, right? The holistic person, whole person approach and how do we help people show up? I love this phrase that you use, the, the moments that matter. Um, yeah. Can you just unpack that a bit more completely for us? Because I think there's a lot of people who hear like executive coach and they're like, well, I'm not a CEO or they hear NFL combine. And they're like, I'm not a high performance athlete, but I think what we have to talk about today doesn't really only apply to these extraordinary circumstances. They can apply to more day-to-day -day things. So Every can you just day life. Share that. Yeah. Absolutely. What's, Every what's day life. Moments that matter mean. Yeah. It's look. Exos has for years, probably at times, struggled to articulate clearly, you know, who we support and what we do. Uh, oh, those are the gym guys, or hey, they work with combine athletes, and. At the end of the day, we can say sitting in front of us is a human. We work in this, you know, business of humans. And with that human, they've got something that is meaningful to them that they would like to show up as their best self for, right? And that's it. And there's no judgment on what that is. It's not up to us to decide the value of their goal. It's for them to have a goal. And so we can support, yes, we can support those extreme examples, the, the CEO, the executive, or the NFL combine athlete. But what about the person who just wants to, I don't know, be, this is my current goal right now, everything for me is be a better dad, right? Like, how do I make sure that I've got the inner awareness to know what I'm currently feeling, what my current state is? Uh, I liked how you said uh, developing a friendship with your nervous system and then be able to intentionally <laughs> begin to regulate so that when my kid makes a mistake, or spills grape juice on the carpet, I don't react. I thoughtfully respond. I think of the Viktor Frankl quote, right? That the space between stimulus and result uh, response is our greatest opportunity, our greatest freedom. Yeah. In that moment, how can I regulate to be the father that I want to be? That doesn't have to be this monumental, I'm running a 40 at the combine, but that moment, in that moment with my child, that's what matters the most to me in that moment. And so, that phrase was our way of saying, we want to support everybody and whatever is important to them. And the emphasis is that it's, on, it's, it's what's important to them, not us. And if it's important to you, 
we want to help you identify what your limiting gap, limiting factors are, identify your gaps and help you understand how to have that friendship with your, you know, with your nervous system your to help you show up in the moment, able to tap into this capacity you've built so that you can succeed in whatever it is you're trying to succeed in. Yeah. Thank you for sharing such a, a, what I think of as a beautiful example, right? I think we all can relate to that time that we are overstimulated or underslept and we snap at someone we love regardless of the age and relationship. Um, and I, I love that for someone in your position and your depth and breadth of knowledge, that that's what it means to you right now. Um, I think that's really impactful regardless of background. So where, where does one even start, right? If we're talking about readiness as your ability to show up in this way, I think a lot of us have been taught to think about, you know, essentially like sleep and meditation, right? Like those are the two recovery things that get really consistently pushed. Like, ah, get better sleep and, and sit and meditate. Do you think of it that way? And if not, how do you think of it? Yeah, we do think of it a little bit differently. And that's not to say that sleep and meditation aren't fantastic. And it's not to say they aren't regular practices of mine. And in fact, quite often when talking recovery, two of the first things we talk about are sleep and a stillness practice. Uh, but we do think about it a little bit differently. We think about it as, you know, through a model of human performance, what anyone wants to achieve, we need to look at what are the elements it takes to achieve that. And so the first thing we do is we look at the person in front of us and there's sort of four things that we'll think through. The first is what we'd call foundational characteristics. Now, foundational characteristics are things that as coaches, we're not gonna be able to influence as much. They're things that do not change about a person or when they do change, they change over a very long duration of time. But we're talking about things like, uh, we're talking about things like their demographics. We're talking about health history. These are important things to know. In the sports world, the example I always use is if I'm working with an athlete, that has sickle cell anemia. Mm -hmm. I better know they have sickle cell anemia. I'm not going to change the fact they do, but I should know that. And in outside yeah. of the sporting world, you're talking about their disposition, their demographics, their background, like getting to know them. So that's the first thing we look at is foundational characteristics. Uh, the second thing we look at is what we call their psychological drivers. It's really important to understand what they want and why they want it. And the why is more important than anything else. It's why they do the things they do, and sometimes more importantly, why they don't do the things they don't do. And mm -hmm. so if we're going to have success, we need to, in, in helping someone get ready, the next question naturally has to be, well, get ready for what, right? Mm -hmm. Now we can start to say, what does this person have to be capable of in order to go do this thing they've just told us is meaningful to them? is important to them. So it gets us to our third thing we look to evaluate in a person in front of us. And it is uh, what we call your performance capacity. Your performance capacity is made up of these skills, these attributes, these characteristics across mindset, nutrition, movement, and recovery. So looking again at the whole human, what does it take to be successful in that goal? And how are we going to strategically provide game plans that increase those abilities, that close those gaps so that you're more able to show up with the capacity required to succeed at the goal? And then the last piece is functional state of saying, how do you need to tune the dial on your nervous system to be ready to tap into the capacity you've built? And it's an important nuance here because most of the conversation admittedly is around recovery when it comes to functional state. Most people want to talk about how to recover. But I will say there are times when you need to turn the dial up. So if I can share, hopefully this is okay to share, but right before <laughs> we started, right, you, you were dancing with the music and we had a good little laugh about it. But I said, that's you leveraging your relationship with your nervous system, right? That's you actually turning the dial up because recording this podcast right now is a moment that matters the most yeah. for you in this moment. You want to be your best self. And it wasn't about how do you turn the dial down to recover. In that moment, you wanted to turn the dial up. Absolutely. Spot on. Um, you're listening to the Better Than Fine podcast. I'm your host, Charlene Marshall, with a little frog in my throat. Um, our guest is Stefan Underwood from Exos, and we're talking about how we redefine readiness. And so, Stefan, you just unpacked, um, I so a lot. You're, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's great. It's great. I love it. And I want to just help the listener to an entry point here. So um, 
we talked about like what's what's the stuff we can't change, right? Like yep. I'm I'm glad you said sickle cell anemia. My immediate thought was like chronic illness, right? I have a genetic condition. There's yeah. no way that's disappearing. And any protocol I run has to uh you know give credence to that, right? It has to, yeah. to give leverage to that. What is our like psychological state? What are my motivators? What is it that I want and why do I want them? What's driving the individual? Then we talk about building capacity. And then we talked about essentially state management, right? Did I get those yeah. right? You absolutely did. And I should say one of the things that I sometimes struggle with is getting it into really comfortable language. I don't want it mm -hmm. to sound too clinical, right? This is an ongoing process of relationship management when you're coaching someone. This is an ongoing conversation. So it's not like we'd say, hey, Darlene, nice to meet you. Now let's go through your health history. Check, 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 check. Let's go through uh, values exploration on the first day when you just met me, but let's talk about your deepest, most meaningful values. <laughs> and then let's go in. It's not a, a, a clinical or uh, a, a vanilla approach like that. There is obviously a nuanced approach to how you bring this to life through emotional intelligence and the act of like compassionate coaching. But yeah, I need to know as much as I can about you in the initial meetings I have with you to be able to be that guide by the side. And I should form an opinion, understand who you are fundamentally, what you're aiming to do and why that's important to you so that I can contextualize things I say back to that deep value. So we start tapping into you know, really strong, durable sources of motivation. And then with respect to the goal, what do you need to be capable of? And then when the moment arises, what's that state management look like to tune the dial to make sure you're adequately recovered, but also not so flat that you don't show up in the moment. And if that takes a little dance before going live, then <laughs> uh, that's what it is. Yeah. And you, you did hit the nail on the head when you mentioned the the dancing, because that is exactly why I do it. I, and I've done it, Eric's, Eric, our producer teases me because I've done it since the first episode. And I was so nervous the first time because I'd done this show for two years alone. And now all of a sudden, like, oh, NASM is producing my show. So I danced to try to purge the nerves. And then I just kept it from there. Um, but I think it actually, I'm so glad you said it. And yeah, you didn't give anything you shouldn't have away. <laughs> Because it does lend to this idea that it doesn't have to be these big priming activities that help us to readiness, right? It's systems that we have in place. And it can also be little things that give us nudges toward the state of being that we want to show up as. Um, do you want to expound on I, that? A little bit? I do, because I think that's one of the most important things to cover, especially when we get into recovery, even if we just talk about recovery. But we can talk about during the dial-up as well. But I think a lot of the reasons that maybe some people don't prioritize recovery, look, everyone knows it's good for you, right? I've got a slide I put in a, in a slide deck when we get to sleep. The title just says, you know, it just says sleep. It's a quote that just says sleep is good for you and is attributed to every mom in history. Like we, <laughs> we know sleep is good for us, yet why do we not necessarily as a society prioritize it? If, if you look over the last hundred years, um, we've shaved almost a third of this like amazing system of sleep oh. of what we do like 19, I think it was 1922. The average American slept for like 9.2 hours. And if you look at research today, um, you're getting anywhere from 6.3 to 6 point like eight or nine hours. So we've oh. shaved a quarter to a third off of this amazing system. So we have to say why. And I think it's this, this feeling of busyness, having so much to do and, and people are willing to eat away from their sleep. But it also means when I say, Hey, let's prioritize your recovery. I think one of the things that gets in the way is people perceive it to be uh, something that will be too time consuming, too large. Like I don't have another 45 minutes in the day to do this. I don't have another a 90 minutes in the middle of the day to take a nap. Thank you for offering, but I, I don't have the time. And when we can say, listen, when you get into that micro break, when we get into how you just slightly tune the dial, there's some really compelling things you can do in short durations. Uh, I like, there's research that was done out of Microsoft, uh, their, their human performance lab. And they looked at individuals, they did uh, EEG brain scans, and they basically mapped out by brainwave patterns, but they basically mapped out stress, sort of a heat map of the brain, so to speak, across four meetings, back to back to back to back. They had one group go literally back to back to back to back. They had another group get just five minutes of reprieve in between. And in those five minute micro breaks, 
where you can engage in a very simple activity of recovery, we can give some examples in a moment, you see tangible differences between the two groups. And by the way, when I say four meetings, they only did 30 minute meetings. We're only talking two hours of work. Mm -hmm. And think of how many people are probably listening that go through eight hours of back to back to back to back to back to back for their work day. We're not evolved to exist in the world that we've made for ourselves, right? Like that's not the way the human system is made. And so if we can say, what's something I can do in five minutes, in three minutes, in two minutes, if I need to tune the dial, like turn it down because I'm, I have the inner awareness from my stillness practice to know that I'm getting a bit agitated. I'm frustrated. I've literally on calls before done, if anyone you know, is familiar with Andrew Huberman's work, a, psych, a, a physiological side. I've literally on a call just muted myself and just... Let me do it right now. You feel in one breath cycle of that, you feel a difference. Like you feel a shift in your state. Yeah. And so to teach people, if you do that two or three times, can really make a difference. Can you teach Same. us now? Can you teach us now? Yeah. So physiological oh, side, sure. interest, interestingly enough, physiological side, right? Like I love things that come from very logical places. Watch when people cry and they're trying to turn themselves down. Like they're sobbing, like, <laughs> right? This double yeah. inhale, right? Like, and, and, and with this, the sigh aspect, what do people do when they're frustrated? Oh, they sigh. Well, if you put this all together, you get this breath where you're going to have a, an inhale followed by another sharp, quick inhale into a nice long exhale. So you just. Trying not to cough. <laughs> yeah. Right. Coming off COVID. It's great. Um, and, and, and so that would be a physiological side and there's other triggers we can use. And some people use the word hacks and I don't like the word hack because. Know. And neither does Huberman. Huberman and, and doesn't like does... the word hack either. No, because it's not a hack. You're not hacking anything. You're working with your biology, right? Like, I'm not breaking the mainframe. <laughs> exactly. And, and so you talk about your eyes, right? Like breathing is a really key way we know we can ha- you know, improve that relationship with our autonomic nervous system, the way we can turn the dial up, turn the dial down. Well, our eyes do that as well. So it's a bi-directional relationship. So same as fight or flight, if there was all of a sudden a tiger behind me, my peripheral vision isn't engaged. I'm in very focal vision. I'm staring at that threat. I need to keep an eye on that threat. Whereas when there isn't a threat, I can engage this nice panoramic vision. So panoramic vision is also calming. So if you get outside, you look at the horizon. So I'll be on a call. I'll gaze out my window when I'm not in my basement gym. Um, Closing your eyes is the same as panoramic vision. So if you need, literally, if you had three minutes between calls and instead of jumping on emails in that time or being frantic, if you sat still, closed your eyes, and did a few rounds of those physiological size. You'd feel a, 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 a shift in your state, helping you be more ready for the call you're about to go on to. You know what I think I hear that, that a kind of bell that just rang in my head. You know, often I think when I'm talking to clients about, like you're talking about the nervous system, right? So mm-hmm. let me bring the, the listener up to us. So sympathetic, right, is upregulated. Parasympathetic, I always teach it like it's a parachute. It's bringing you back. Oh, I like that. I like that. And yeah, it helps people remember that one. So the fight or flight, right, upregulated, we often think about like, okay, the, the lion is coming, right? That's a very reactive way of thinking about it. And I think we also expect a reactive calming, right? And I mm. think that that's where people get into this belief around like, okay, I'm going to go home and I'm going to have a glass of wine. I'm going to sit in the front of the couch and then I'll react, relax. But oftentimes some of those stimulus are also overstimulating and they keep us up. Whereas what I hear you saying is the intentionality of using the hardware to cause the reaction that we want. So something like an intentional breath or peripheral vision or closing your eyes and, and slow exhales, right? Those are proactive priming of the parasympathetic response, right? We're trying to elicit they it. Yeah, they are. And I go, I would go a step further even. I'm yeah. saying that none of this works if you don't have the inner awareness to know where you are. So you come back to, you said, is it all about sleep and meditation? Well, this is where a stillness practice or meditation is so good, right? So important. If you don't recognize how you're feeling, it's like a GPS that's trying to tell you where to go, but you can't locate where you are right now. 
Good it just God. doesn't work. And so it's just a, a, a fundamentally flawed system. Yeah, you're just lost so, in the woods. Yeah, exactly. And so inner awareness, which comes from in our game plans we provide for members because we are so much more than the gym people. For us, that's what we call a reflective practice or reflection, right? Reflection pairs with regulation practices. You have to reflect on a regular basis. That's what that stillness practice is doing for you right? That intrinsic sense of this is how I'm feeling. I am attuned to my body right now. I'm aware of the state I'm in. So I can see if that matches to the state I should be in for the thing I'm doing that is important to me in this moment. So use the word intentionality. That's exactly what it is. And that's why it's not always just recovery. It's intentionality saying, where do I need to go? And what are the ways I can leverage my biology to get there? And specifically, how can you recognize the way you're feeling and have an equally appropriate measure? Here's the example. There's a difference between feeling agitated, right? Annoyed, irritable is very different inner state, okay? To feeling flat, apathetic, lethargic. But both those feelings could get in the way of you being ready for the moment that matters most. So if I have the inner awareness to say, I need to show up. I need to be great on this podcast and have a great conversation with you. <laughs> well, if coming into it, something had happened where I was feeling agitated and irritated, that's the threat. That's where I would go through the parasympathetic, close your eyes, calm breathing, physiologic sigh, get back to just a level state where I'm not feeling reactive. But if I was, let's say I had a morning where I was back to back to back to back and I was feeling coming in here, I wasn't agitated or annoyed, but I know I had to have a conversation with you. And let's say hypothetically, I was just feeling flat, just done. Well, that's where the greatest showman, which is amazing music. I throw that on <laughs> Apple music yes. and I have a quick little dance party to Hugh Jackman in my kitchen. And I come downstairs and I'm in the right state, ready for the moment that matters. So if you can know what you're feeling, you can know what you need to do to get to where you want to be. I already knew I liked you and that just made me like you that much more. Because the greatest showman. Yeah. Best You're listening to the Better Than Fine podcast. I'm Darlene Marshall and my guest today is Stefan Underwood, where we're redefining readiness and also encouraging you to go absorb some greatest showman because it's absolutely fantastic. Two of my favorite songs are from that show. There you go. Um so to to like start to assemble some puzzle pieces here, what I hear is readiness isn't just okay, you slept in between your workouts, right? It's this Correct. bigger equation, at least in the way that Exos thinks about it, where we have a level of, of awareness of oneself, one's constraints, one's desires, what we want, right? The reason that we're showing up. And then we're building capacity. And I want to circle back to this because I think to me, every time you've talked to me about this capacity building piece, what I hear is resilience. Um, and the way that I frame resilience in my workshops that we've talked about it on this show before is that in the downtimes where you're not under acute stress, what we can be doing is building capacity, which would then increase resilience potential overall. And so every time you talk about building capacity so that when the day comes, you have the access to that state that you want of resilience, um, the capacity building to me is the part of the resilience equation that is often missing. Um, and it's interesting to me how it fits into this readiness framework that you're talking about. Do you want to speak to that at all? And do you, do you give a mind to the resilience piece when you're thinking about this framing? Absolutely. We could say resilience is the outcome of, of all of it. And resilience relative to what depends on their goal. But you're absolutely right. Look, if we think about what readiness tends to mean in the industry, it typically is just your recovered state. Now, listen, yeah. I've, I, I, I use wearables. I'm, I'm wearing one right now that, that is valuable to me. Yeah. So uh, it is worth looking at. But often in the you know world of a lot of the wearables that we engage with, readiness or your readiness score is purely how recovered you are. It's looking at things like the quality of sleep, the amount of sleep you got, the quality or architecture of that sleep, your heart rate variability, your resting heart rate, a little bit in line with the activity balance from what you did the day before. But there's algorithms that put together saying, this is how ready you are, which isn't entirely taking into account the side of the equation on capacity. Mm -hmm. And indirectly could be argued it is because if you have more capacity, then the work you did doesn't disrupt your heart rate variability or your sleep or your resting heart rate as much. 
but it's indirect. We want to very deliberately say, what's the goal that you have? And what are the gaps you've got to improve to get there? And I told you earlier, we, you know, we look at this across mindset, nutrition, movement, and recovery. We've mapped out what those measurable, movable traits are within each of those four categories that are meaningful to us as capacity markers. And so within mindset, we can talk about things that can be measured, by the way, with subjective questionnaires, for sure, mostly on mindset. But like we're talking about things like curiosity. Curiosity is such a great place to start. I love asking people, you know, one of my favorite is, you know, what music do you listen to? Many people, the music they most listen to is the music that they listened to in around high school mm -hmm. because they stopped being curious. If you look at kids, they are so innately curious. But as adults, we have to very intentionally work on maintaining that curiosity. But that curiosity is what unlocks everything in a growth mindset. So curiosity is a performance quality that we can look at in a person. So those inner awareness I've mentioned, uh, I've mentioned self-regulation, uh, you know, grit. These are things that we can look at in mindset. But in nutrition, we can look at things like your gut microbiome. We can look at your body composition. We can look at your nutrient availability. In movement, if you have a movement goal, we can look at things like your movement efficiency, how well you move. We can look at your force velocity profile. We can look at your endurance. And within recovery, we can look at the skill of sleeping and like how proficient you are in sleep, right? These are just some examples. These are all measurable, movable things. And when a person get, tells us their goal, what their moment is, we say, what is the one of like, what are the categories that most align to this person's goals? We don't measure all of these things for all people. Mm. But if a person says, I'm just trying to be the dad that wants to show up wholly for my kids and keep my cool with them. I tend to come home from work stressed out and I tend to sometimes snap and be the person I don't want to be. Well, I don't care about their uh, in movement. I'll, I'll say I don't care about their force of velocity profile for that goal. Yeah. But if a person says, I need to run a 4-3-40 at the NFL combine, well, now, now I care maybe even more about their, not to say that curiosity doesn't matter, but maybe I care more about their force velocity profile than their curiosity. Um, and we work, we seek to build capacity so that people are capable of doing more. And then the functional state side of readiness is just making sure that they're, when the moment matters, able to tap into all the hard work they did over here. Yeah, they can prime that pump. Yeah. I want to circle back to something you just said um, that I've, I've not heard another practitioner say, and I want you to build out a, a little bit more. Okay. You described sleep as a skill. Mm. What do you mean by that? Well, uh, fundamentally, what I mean by that is it is something that you can intentionally practice and get better at. It, it isn't a disposition. Like, it's not to say that there aren't uh, obviously some clinical things people could talk about. Like, there's certainly other parameters, and that's a whole other conversation with likely a whole different expert to myself um, <laughs> on a diff different topic. But fundamentally, for most people, if you intentionally work, on getting your biology on board. And what I mean by that is circadian entrainment or working with your circadian rhythm, giving it anchor points through the day. So you say, okay, I'm going to go out. I'm going to observe natural light through my bare eyeballs um, in the morning when I first wake up. And in the evening, I'm going to, again, make sure I get out on my deck and I'm going to observe natural light. Those in the change in hues of the light, light serves as a key anchor point. Okay, for your circadian rhythm. So that's starting to get my biology on board, starts helping my system know that it's time to be awake or time to sleep, i.e. that 24 hour circadian rhythm. You can also get your biology on board by addressing any airway issues, right? So do you have, are, are, are you breathing through your nose? Do you have good, sufficient airways? And there's things you can do there to improve your airways. Then once we've got biology on board, and there's more in that conversation, but moving along, do you then set your sleep environment? So do you intentionally set your dark room, cool room, quiet room, those things we talk about? And then finally, do you have strategies for uh, sleep disruptors? Do you know the cost of alcohol? You referenced coming home and having that glass of wine, right? That so many of us will do. Yeah, and I say this non-judgmentally. I, I know I say this fully non-judgmentally. Um, 
not to say that I don't ever have a glass of wine, but I know the cost of it. So it's, it's a cost benefit analysis and it's a decision. Yep. I can tell you this, I absolutely on, you know, family dinner, I enjoy a glass of wine, but when I've got something big on a day, I don't have any alcohol the night before. When I travel for work and everybody's out, all the sales team are out of people are having drinks. I don't because I know the cost of that for my sleep and what I do the next day. So when you look at all these things, if there's, you know, levers that we can pull to intentionally get better at something with practice, that makes it a skill. Cool. So, so to me, sleep is absolutely a skill that we can get better at and we can seek to own our sleep. Yeah. I love that framing. Um, you know, I obviously often talk about sleep as a drive and a collection of habits, but the idea that it's a set of skills and a practice, uh, my, my brain is playing with that a lot. You're listening to the Better Than Fine podcast. I'm your host, Arlene Marshall. My guest is Stefan Underwood. We're talking about how do we redefine readiness? How is it more than just sleep? And, you know, Stefan, I've had plenty of clients that come into the coaching relationship and they feel stuck. They feel like, you know, they know what they should be doing. They follow enough people on their social media weapon of choice to have shamed themselves into feeling like they can't get it right. And they want to understand, they want to tap into deeper states of readiness, of recovery, and they're experiencing some wellness overwhelm and, and feeling a bit overloaded by all of it. And I feel like in this conversation, we've unpacked a lot of ideas that could send those wheels spinning. What guidance would you give to them if, if they're feeling that way? I think that's such an important question. And I would start off by saying my son, this might be the biggest mistake of my year, but we just bought my son an electric guitar. Um, nice. And I had this whole debate on, do we start with acoustic or electric? And a person in the guitar store said, listen, get him the one he's most interested in because mm. then he's more likely to stick with it. And I was like, huh, sounds like coaching. So, <laughs> uh, so we went with the electric guitar because it's my son. Um, and and so to answer the question, I think you're absolutely right. People get overwhelmed. And I think that sometimes as coaches, we contribute to that. And it's oh, knowing yeah. the difference between coming on a podcast and speaking a lot of ideas high level versus having a person in front of me that I need to empathetically see and know that that's not the time to throw all of this on the table. Uh, when we think of well-being, right, and wellness, whatever language we want to use, it is... Um, there's an interconnected web. Everything has this bi-directional highway, right? Like gut health matters for the brain. My brain matters for how uh, I, I want to exercise and sleep. My sleep influences my exercise. My exercise influences my sleep. Both are influenced by nutrition, both influence nutrition. Like there's this totally interconnected web. And so I think what I would say is tying these two thoughts together of learning the electric guitar and this interconnected web is start by picking one thing and pick one thing that you're most interested in that ties to your psychological drivers, your values, your why. So if you're totally intimidated by the gym, but you sort of really enjoy culinary skills, like you like cooking, then why force the gym as the first avenue in and, and shame someone, as you, as you said in the word, like a horrible, a strong motivator, but I'd argue not a healthy mm -hmm. motivator. Not right? when you want to integrate. Not when you want to integrate. So, so for that person, like how do we lean into the culinary skill side of the conversation? Because as they start changing their gut biome through what they eat and they get into well-being through food, it's a logical step that they will come to physical activity, but let's not force it. On the flip side, you got that person who just has their nutritional habits that they love, but they really are keen on being in this setting behind me lean in there. You got a person who's willing to meditate, like lean into what they're most interested in and what resonates with them as your starting place. And then just give it time. Cause all we're trying to do is keep you in that web um, and keep you coming back for another session so that we can really unpack more. So too much too soon can definitely overwhelm and help them get nowhere. If you want someone to be ready pick the door that they're willing to open for you into that interconnected web, step through that door, embrace it, and then ultimately guide them looking at why they want to do what they want to do and what they want to do, what you need to do to improve their capacity to get there, and how when those moments arise, 
you can help them tune that dial so the best version of themselves show up and they have that capacity on demand. And when you can hit those three things, psychological drivers, capacity, and functional state, then the person is ready for the moment that matters most. Love it. I'm going to add, okay, I got two things. Yes. The one thing I want to add to that sequence is then create an opportunity for them to have positive reflection mm. so that they get the positive emotional payoff, which means they're more likely to repeat the behaviors, right? That's like, right. oh, wow, I was able to show up in a way I never had before. How did that feel? And now you're creating positive reinforcement, um, which is just going to perpetuate the upward spiral. Absolutely. I love that. The other thing I want to validate is my dad also bought me an electric guitar for Christmas. And after 20 years of playing acoustic, electric is so much easier. Oh my God, I wish someone had given me one 20 years ago. Good job, dad. That's so good <laughs> to hear. That it's makes my day. Good choices, man. Um, Stefan, any final thoughts for our listeners? Any uh, Where could they find you? Anything that you want to throw out as resources? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I am the world's worst at social media as in I don't huh. do it. Uh, so I am on LinkedIn, uh, just under my name is Stefan Underwood, but uh, I'm not too active on social media, to be honest. But uh, what I'd love is if people want to learn more about this is for them to engage with Exos, uh, knowing that I'm, I'm a, a part of that. Uh, and so it, you can find Exos on all of your regular social media outlets on Instagram uh, and on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find separate channels for Exos education. Uh, and if you just keep an eye out, we're going to all year be proving out more and more content that is sort of thought leadership around this readiness conversation, how to help people be ready for the moments that matter most in work, sport, life, anytime, anywhere, and uh, how to really start applying that to corporate population more than the athletes. And so you'll see a lot of content this year from us of redefining uh, what the future of work looks like through our eyes. And we're really excited to be able to share that. Yeah. And I'm so excited that you came on the show at the start of the year to share as you're rolling out this content, because I think for, you know, NASM's wellness coaches, it's very aligned with our vision for what we do. And I think it's a great opportunity to learn um, alongside all of you. So thank you so much, Stefan, for coming on and sharing, um, you know, all of your wealth of knowledge with our listeners. I appreciate that very much. Well, thank you, Darlene. I really appreciate the invite in. I always enjoy our conversations. And I know you've got one of my teammates, uh, Chris Bertram, joining, and he might have the one job title in the world that is more interesting than my job title because Ooh, he what's has... his title? Well, his title for us is Senior Director of Applied Neuroscience, but he does some side work with Olympic snowboarders and his official title is Flow Coach. And That's that what is I thought. way cooler of a title than what I do. So listen to Chris Bertram. He is amazing. Uh, and that's what he's coming simple. on to talk about is Absolutely. climbing flow. So I don't know, is flow coach cooler than VP, vice president of methodology? Like I'm a big enough science nerd that that's fair. That it hits, it hits a sweet spot for me and probably for lots of our listeners, but thank you Stephen, well, I appreciate for joining that. us. I appreciate uh, thank it you so, so much. much. Absolutely. And if anytime. what we've been talking about today has really uh, primed your pump, you might be interested in learning some more about all of the different um, sub factors of readiness that we've been talking about today. And the National Academy of Sports Medicine, NASM, who pr produces this show, has a wellness coaching certification that I was honored to be one of the subject matter experts contributing to. So there are other experts on sleep, stress, coaching, neuroscience, movement, obviously positive psychology, totally my jam. And how do you actually help someone prime and sustain positive change in the way that Stefan and I have been talking about, right? The the coach along the side. I think he had a better phrase for it, but I'm rolling with it because we all know just telling people what to do doesn't actually help. Well, that certification is currently 50% off over at NASM's website, nasm.org. But listeners of this show get an additional $600 off with the code MarshallCWC. M-A-R-S-H-A-L-L-C-W-C. -L -L -C. So it's a stacking discount. Go to nasm.org, click wellness at the top and use that promo code for $600 off the current sale price. 
And of course, we would love to hear your feedback if this episode has had an impact on you. So you could email me, info at darlene.coach. You can find me on Instagram, which is also darlene.coach. I'm also on LinkedIn. And you could check out the More Better Substack, which is coachdar.substack.com. And that's where we put up articles where we take all of the applied practice from this show and give you a reference base that you can build your own practices out of. If you're a fan of the show and you're not already, please hit subscribe. Thank you to everyone who's been writing us reviews and reaching out with feedback. I've gotten some great suggestions recently that are going to influence the next season of the show. I so appreciate it. And when you share about the show, please do tag me on whatever social media platform you're on. Thank you all for listening. Be well and recording on Valentine's Day. So hope you're out there practicing that self-love and thanks.